morning and welcome to worship with Blue Mountain Salvos. I say good morning because our um, service is set to, to air on Facebook and YouTube or wherever you're watching from at 9.30 on Sunday morning. But wherever you're watching from, whether it be morning or evening, or what day you are watching, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, any day, there's a sense in which we gather together because right around the world there are, uh, there exists a community of believers, a community of disciples who seek to order their whole world, their whole life around this central being, around God, Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And so we begin and we center our lives around the worship of Him. And so even though uh, you're not with us in our building, worshipping together, you're with us in spirit as together we put first the worship of our God and our Saviour. And as we allow Him to speak to us, we allow His Word to enter our hearts and transform our minds, transform our thinking. And as He helps us to order our lives around Him, around His purpose and around His will. This is our final week in January, in the January series, and the topic uh, that we're looking at today is witness. As with past weeks, I'm sure you have a pretty good understanding of what this word means, at least in our context today. And we're going to dig a little bit deeper using the Bible Project resources as we have been doing through January. We're going to dig a little bit deeper into this word and what it was meant when it was employed by the biblical authors, what they were trying to communicate. But as a starting point for us this morning, I want us to consider our own story. What has God done for us? What has God done for you? What does it mean for you to have encountered Christ? How has that changed your life? As we begin reflecting on this topic, we're going to um, listen to a well-known song. It's um, an old hymn, Amazing Grace, that's been more recently updated uh, to include the chorus, My Chains Are Gone. And it tells the story of God interacting with his people and changing lives, changing the individual's life. So as we listen to this song together this morning, um, I encourage you, I invite you, to consider your story. How, how has God impacted your life and changed your life? Change. 
But God who called me here below will be forever mine. Will be forever mine. You are forever mine. Let's pray. Our great and loving God, we come before you today. We bow before you today and we worship your great name. Because of your amazing grace, God, we can enter your presence, broken as we are, and receive life from you. Real life that you intended for us at creation. Real life given through your Son, Jesus. Real life received because of your unending love for us, your most beloved of all creation. Lord, I pray that in this moment as we sit at your feet, that the enormity of your love for us would overwhelm us. That it would overwhelm us to the point where there are no longer obstacles that would hinder us in sharing this love with others. So today, Lord, as we consider the biblical use of this term witness, we ask that you would open our hearts and minds and bring us to a point where we are ready and willing to receive more from you. To learn more about this word that we already know and to be challenged by your words to us. Be challenged by your call to us. By the task that you give us. May we be encouraged by your word to us this morning. Amen. When you hear the word witness, you might think of someone who sees something shocking or important and then shares their testimony with others. The word witness is used like this in the Bible too, but here's what's really fascinating. This word actually helps us understand the entire storyline of scripture. In the Bible, a witness is basically someone who sees something important or amazing. In Hebrew, this person is an aid, and in Greek, a martus. And if this person begins to share what they've seen, we call this bearing witness, in Hebrew, oud, and in Greek, martyreo. So in the story of Ruth, when Boaz buys land from Naomi's family, he calls together witnesses to see the transaction, so that if there's a later dispute about the land, they can bear witness about what they saw. So that's the basic meaning of the word witness. Now, if we follow this idea throughout the Bible, we learn that God wants a group of witnesses, people who see and experience him to ood or represent him to the world. So beginning with the story of the Exodus, the people of Israel witness Yahweh as the powerful king of the nations when he rescues them from slavery. Then he appoints this one nation to bear witness or ood to the rest of the nations about what they experienced. He calls them a kingdom of priests or people who connect all other nations to Yahweh, the true God and King. But there's a big problem. The Israelites aren't good witnesses. In fact, they start worshiping other gods. So God raises up a chief witness, Moses, to ood or bear witness to the people who are supposed to be the real witnesses. When Moses meets with Yahweh on Mount Sinai, he sees and experiences God face to face. When he comes down, he ooods, he bears witness to the people about his experience. He even writes a song as a witness so that they would never forget how God has cared for and rescued them. But as the story goes on, Israel does forget. They fail to truly see God, so they fail as his witnesses. So God raises up prophets who are like Moses to ood, to open their eyes to who their God really is. Like Isaiah. He has a vision of God as the cosmic king, and he's sent to Ut to bear witness to the Israel of his day because they're blind, they're corrupt, and they don't recognize God as their king. So Isaiah says that one day God will raise up the ultimate chief witness, a figure called the servant. He will open the eyes of the blind so that they can truly see Yahweh and bear witness to the nations that their God is the king who will rescue the world. And now, when we turn to the story of Jesus, we find him claiming to be that servant and witness spoken of by Isaiah. He's the ultimate witness, or in Greek, the martus. Crowds of people witness him saying that he's bringing God's kingdom, that it's here, right now, through him. They see Jesus healing people, even restoring sight to the blind. 
Many recognize who he is and respond to his message, but many others still refuse to truly see. Even the nation's leaders won't listen to him. Rather, they kill Jesus for bearing witness to God's kingdom, that is, for being a martyr. In fact, this is where the word martyr comes from. But then, after Jesus' death, something amazing happens. Jesus' friends see him, alive from the dead, and they recognize that he is the divine king, Yahweh himself, who has come to rescue the world. After that, Jesus sends them out to martyreo, that is, to bear witness to the nations, to open their eyes to this risen king who has conquered death and who offers freedom and rescue and the hope of a new creation. And it's this story about Jesus that's been spread all around the world by faithful witnesses. And to this day, when someone hears the story of Jesus and experiences the love of God for all humanity, the most natural thing to do is to simply bear witness. If you're watching with a group of people, I invite you to consider these uh, questions and discuss them together. If you're on your own though, why not grab your journal or a piece of paper and write down some thoughts as you consider these questions. Our first question today is, how would you summarize this week's video? Today's passage comes from Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. And the disciples are told to go to a mountain after witnessing Jesus' life, death, and powerful resurrection. When they see Jesus alive on the mount, this amazing encounter leads many to worship Jesus. But some of the disciples still doubt what they've seen. So Jesus comes closer and tells his disciples to go to all the nations with the authority of his name the testimony of his message and the assurance of his constant presence. Let's read this together. Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. How can you bear witness to what you have seen, heard and learned about Jesus? Why do you think some disciples doubted when they witnessed Jesus alive from the dead? What do you need to believe in order to move away from doubt and to worshipful amazement? Consider again verse 19. What are disciples of Jesus commissioned to do exactly? What happens to our Christian witness when we neglect an aspect of this call? What do you think can happen when we seek to obey Jesus' commission without remembering his promise to never leave us? Reflect on this powerful promise and how it is fulfilled in the gift of the Holy Spirit.
One of the lines that stood out most to me from this week's study was the idea that witness, the word witness, helps us to understand the entire storyline of the Bible. When I was younger, my view of the Bible was somewhat limited. I knew it was God's word, but at the same time, it was just a book about a bunch of people that lived so long ago that it's difficult to even understand them, let alone learn from them. The only thing that really held any significance for me, not that I would have admitted it at the time, um, but the only thing that really spoke to me was the Gospels, because the stories about Jesus were really, really important. So probably up until the time I left high school, even though I dabbled in reading the rest of the Bible, and I knew I was supposed to read the rest of the Bible, the only parts that I really focused on, or well not even focused on, but the only parts I guess that really spoke to me, I felt, were the Gospels. They were the ones, they were the books that I understood. I really struggled to see how the rest impacted me, apart from the history, I suppose. But when we take this idea of witness, we realize that the entire book of the Bible is the story of God and his dealings or interactions with his people, with humankind. And in that sense, the story of the Bible has not finished because humanity is still very much around and God is still interacting with them. Well, at least that's what we say we believe. So if this is my belief, and if I am encountering God to the point in which my whole life has been transformed by his grace and his love through the sacrifice Jesus made on the cross for me and through his constant presence with me in the person of the Holy Spirit, then I have a pretty significant story to tell. I have a pretty powerful story to bear witness to. We have in our hands in the scriptures the story of the past. But we're the only ones that can communicate to the world that the story is still going. That God is still reaching out to his beloved creation, calling them to himself and revealing himself in sometimes incredible and sometimes ordinary ways. That's my story to tell. What's your story? As we consider our story and what it is we want to bear witness to, I want us to listen to a song. And it's not the usual kind of song that we would pick for a reflection time. It's certainly not um, a slow one, but it's called Jesus, Hope of the Nations. Because really what we're wanting to testify to is this idea that our hope comes from Jesus. That our hope is secure in Jesus. That we have encountered God because Jesus has taken up residence in our lives and changed us. That because of his resurrected life, we are invited to join him in the new life. To live life to its fullness in the fellowship of God. Father, Son and Holy Spirit. The story of the Bible is a story of God interacting with his people. Revealing himself to his people. And the most significant revelation of God came in the person of Jesus. When Jesus showed us what God's heart was like. When Jesus showed us what God's nature was like. And then God bound himself to us, to humanity through the birth of Jesus. And he opened the door for us to enter new life with him through his death and resurrection on the cross. There is hope in Jesus. And this is the story that we are to tell. This is the truth that we are to bear witness to.
I've done every week, I just want to um, say a big thank you uh, to the Bible Project uh, for the resources that they have developed. I found them significant myself in working through them this month, and I hope you have too. Uh, as I said, this is our last week in this study, but there are so much more available on the Bible Project website. Um, so if you're looking for some some resources for your own personal study, want to have a look if you've not already done that. Uh, the website is below me, bibleproject.com. And now let me finish up and bring this series to a close uh, with the benediction. You are God's servant and his most beloved creation. And just as God has pursued you, has called you to himself to pour out his love upon you, he now tasks you to tell the story of that love, to tell the story of his love so that others might come to experience his amazing grace and his unending love and find hope in Christ. So go, go into the world to love and serve the Lord in the strength of the Spirit. And may the peace of Christ be with you, the strong arms of God sustain you, and the power of the Holy Spirit strengthen you in every way. Amen. You are